Long time no see. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tim Drama. I'm a senior fellow with the Community Foundations of Canada, and I'm privileged to be a moderator for a panel discussion this evening, which is more of a conversation uh, than uh, presentations with, uh, with slides. And this panel is focused on uh, how new thinking is driving a way of redesigning philanthropy uh, in Canada and around the world. Uh, philanthropy which sees itself as partnering to solve Canada's and the world's complex and wicked challenges. Um, on that note, it is important for us to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, uh, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, Métis people. Um, we want to focus on the changes happening within philanthropy, learning from experiences outside and inside of Canada. Systems thinking and design methodologies that you've been talking about yesterday and today and then going on to tomorrow is also happening within philanthropy. Um, and it has influenced uh, the role of foundations in society leading to the modernization and the emergence of new forms of philanthropic activity that are addressing uh, the, the root causes of social and environmental challenges. Now, uh, I imagine that most of you aren't that familiar with Canadian philanthropy. There are about, uh, you won't believe this, about 10,000 foundations in Canada. They have over $120 billion of assets. Um, about 50 foundations probably have uh, over 80 or maybe even 90% of those assets. So it definitely is, it is Pareto's rule. Um, you may be asking yourself, why would it be important to look at philanthropy? Well, I hope that's something that we'll get to look at uh, with tonight's discussion. But as we look at the world uh, that's coming towards us and the demands around issues like socio-ecological transition, we can see that governments, the private sector, and indeed civil society are all struggling around how they respond to the kinds of challenges that are facing them. And actually there is one small subsector, philanthropy, that actually has an enormous amount of resources that could be extremely helpful as people are trying to figure out the solutions to those, to those problems. So tonight I've got uh, with me three really spectacular people to be able to address this question. And um, the first one I'm going to mention is Cassie Robinson. I'm not going to go through her bio that's on the write-up, but I will say that she comes to us from the United Kingdom. Uh, she works with a whole variety of different philanthropic organizations in different roles, and one of them is with the Jonathan Roundtree Foundation, uh, which for the last two years has held a conference called Next Frontiers in Funding, Philanthropy, and Investment which explores approaches and in investment in philanthropy that are actively challenging practices that prop up aspects of current systems that are not serving people and the planet well. Uh, then immediately on my right is Vanny Jane, and Vanny is the founding director of a relatively new startup foundation, the Daymark Foundation, which is focused on mental health. Vanny's career is focused on education, mental health, corporate social responsibility. And I was privileged to have been her colleague at the McConnell Foundation in Montreal. And then beside Vani is Atif Baskanderi, who is the founding CEO of North Pine Foundation. And it's a new and, and rather large funder. Last year, it funded uh, to the tune of $30 million. And Atif is really interesting coming to this discussion of philanthropy. He doesn't have a background in philanthropy. He comes more uh, from uh, innovation, engineering, and technology, something that he's kind of brought to bear on this, uh, though he has been involved in social change with the historic involvement with engineers uh, without borders. So what I'm going to do is going to start our conversation by turning to each person in turn 
uh, for about five to 10 minutes, just to make sure that you get a sense of where they're coming from and what are the kinds of issues they're dealing with and uh, the nature of the organization. Uh, in, the, in the case of Vani and Pate, uh, that, that, they're, that they're developing. And then we'll kind of open up and have more of a cross conversation between all of us. And also we'll be looking for questions from you and, and from the audience that's uh, joining this uh, virtually uh, online. So, so first of all, I'm gonna turn to Cassie and really to be able to get a bit of a view from outside of Canada. How are these issues about how to design new forms of philanthropy that are more attuned to the kinds of challenges that we face. So, so Vanny, you were the Associate Director of Emerging Futures. You are the Associate Director of Emerging Futures of Joseph Roundtree, and you organized this second iteration of, of Next Frontiers. Um, I think we'd all be really interested in how you could share with us some of the things that came out for you um, out of that conference, which involved, I don't know how many dozens of well, people who were there, hundreds, I joined online from Canada. But if you could just uh, just share with us a bit of how you see the scene globally of the reinvention of philanthropy. Okay. Um, well, it's nice to be here and to see a few faces in the audience that I know um, and to yeah join this conversation. Um, I, I definitely don't feel like I can give a global perspective because I, I I would say I have a lot of blind spots. Um, but I can, yeah, I can share a bit about um, maybe the context for the conference because that really came out of the patterns we were seeing and and thinking of ways to respond to that. Um, I should also say that it's nice to be here because my background is in design, so I I don't. I don't identify as a philanthropist or a funder either. I just happen to be currently working in that field because as Tim said, there is so much potential there to try and influence change. Um, the, the flow of resources and where, where wealth is held and how wealth can be unlocked and then where it moves to is, is gonna be very important um, in, in the coming years. Um, so yeah, the, the conference, really came out of this kind of growing sense that in certainly in UK philanthropy um, it, it's very stuck and there has become how I would describe like two binaries there's a there's a group of people that work in philanthropy that are very um, mechanistic linear data driven rooted in evidence for everything, um, technocratic, um, that that kind of mindset. And then I guess in response to that, um, a lot of philanthropy has been moving towards, um, it's all about shifting power, participatory grant making is the answer to everything. Um, relation, it's all about relationships. We don't need to measure anything. And obviously I'm kind of caricaturing this a little bit. Um, but I, I think those two binaries were keeping and are keeping things quite stuck. And of course, there's aspects of both of those um, kind of binaries that have value, but it was really thinking, so what's beyond both of those? What, what's, how, how do you weave aspects of those into, into like a third space or a different way? And that was one of the reasons why we did the first conference last year was to see whether we could create a space um, for different people, actually not just working in philanthropy because that in and of itself is maybe part of the challenge. So trying to bring together the whole finance ecosystem um, and to see if we could start to unstick things. And I think like one of the things that's really important um, is to work out what is the particular role of philanthropic capital. Like it has a, a particular, maybe a particular like use or purpose in a wider system or in a sequencing of change, which is why we wanted to bring all the different bits of the finance ecology together. I don't know if you want me to, 
say a bit more about some of the other patterns. Yes, that would be great. But they are quite negative, as you said to me. <laughs> so I, I, I have got to look at my slide because it's been a long day. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll share a few more uh, reflections. Again, this is very much from my perspective. I don't even think Joseph Roundtree Foundation would say is their perspective. Um, but th these are some of the challenges that um, I think are keeping us stuck in, in moving resources. So, I mean, obviously there is just increased demand everywhere. We are, there's multiple crises and growing need. So, you know, when you're working in, in funding, there's more and more demand for the, for the money. Um, but actually what that, also means is there's a lot of reactivity and a lot of short-term thinking um, that, that kind of dominates things and I'm not I understand why but we we need something else as well um, I mean I've sort of already touched on this a bit but so much of the work in the UK is really dominated by western mindsets by the logical the linear the, the needing, the need for a case study, the need for a thing to point out, the need for some data, you know, like that that still prevails as it does in, you know, many sectors, not just philanthropy. Um, I think there's also, you know, this, I always fumble a bit maybe when I talk about this, um, the work of like racial justice and decolonization is, you know that's a very very central topic and and like ongoing work in in the philanthropic world in the UK and particularly since George Floyd's murder and the kind of racial justice uprising and that's you know that's a lifetime's work for for us and and I do think there are many foundations that are really meaningfully trying to do work in that area and it it can't be the only thing that we are paying attention to. It has to be central, but other things also need to happen alongside it. And that can feel, you know, that may, it makes me feel uncomfortable even saying it, but it, it, it can't be the only focus. And, and also, I guess there's a lot of, you know, as you'll hear in my voice, there's a, there's a tentativeness, there's a fear, there's an, you know, like people don't want to get it wrong. And so, that 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 has also meant that things are kind of very stuck in some ways um there's also a kind of trend in progressive philanthropy and i say progressive because i don't even really know what that means in this context um where i think you're you're progressive if you're if you're spending down so that's a really big trend um you know everyone should spend down their endowments and um like move their capital and again I don't think that that's the wrong thing to do I just don't think we know for sure that that's what we think we want everyone to do especially if we're in these periods of transition and actually maybe we want to be a bit more strategic about a sequencing again to that kind of spend down or that kind of movement of capital so there's yeah, there's, there's a kind of expectation that if you're progressive in philanthropy, there's a few things you would definitely be doing. Another one is that you really only would fund movements rather than recognize that maybe we need movements and institutions and infrastructure. And, you know, like that, I guess there's there's generally not a lot of plurality in the thinking. Um, and I guess as a result of all those things, a lot of funding I mean this is probably the thing I go on about the most um you know most funding is still going into first and second horizon work it is responding to the immediate need it, it is really plaster sticking a lot of the time and just repatterning kind of what we already have and propping it up and it's you know even in a lot of the shifting power work it feels like people are moving pieces on a chessboard but they're not redesigning the chessboard mm -hmm. and it actually that kind of a the the the, the skill and the, the ability to discern between what is a second and third horizon kind of 
initiative rather than just a first or second like that kind of discernment and attunement is I mean I I also don't know how to do that by the way I'm not you know but that that's it's a practice it's a skill and that's my other point I I have come into the to this field I guess with a quite a different set of skills from a lot of the people that I know that work in philanthropy and I often wonder if we have some of the right skills working in that field for some of the types of work that need to happen um, and that kind of discernment around what's really systemic or transformative um, is is definitely not a strength in the sector at the moment um, and then I guess almost lastly um because i'm going to add in one more thing um i i think and this again i don't think this is this is just in philanthropy but mostly most funders are not engaging with the scale and complexity of the challenges we have on any level and you know we are facing enormous catastrophe and crises and um yeah i i feel like there's still so much incrementalism and very few funders that are kind of trying to really meet this moment. Um, and then I'll say all of that and also say, oh, well, two more things and then I'll shut up. It's not like me to normally talk for this long. <laughs> um, there are also some good things happening, which I think we'll hopefully get to in conversation. I wouldn't be staying doing this work if I didn't also see some of the potential and possibility of what can be done. And there are, um, yeah, there are some, there are some good things happening. I also feel like I want to sort of, I, I feel like I've been quite critical of um, philanthropy. I also think it's very hard working in philanthropy right now too, because there are so many different contradictory asks and expectations of you. So on the one hand, you have um, a group of people saying, get out the way. All you're there for is to move money, get out of the way. You don't have any expertise. Your expertise is not of value because the only expertise that's of value is community expertise or lived it. So like, get out of the way. And then you have other people like Indy Johar, who some of you will know, who would say, please don't get out of the way. I, I need you to just be wiser and engage with the complexity, but don't get out of the way. Um, you know, so there's a lot of contradictions of what's being asked of you. Um, and it's very hard to know how to be. And also because the demand is going up for resources, I don't think anyone in philanthropy is very well equipped to be able to turn their back on people and lives and things, but they are, they are already having to, and they're going to need to more. Um, and like, what does that mean? How does that feel? What's the experience of that? And I, I think there's all of those kind of things that people, when you work in funding, you get a lot of people frustrated at you. And I also understand why having never been successful at getting any funding when I was working on the other side of the fence. But, you know, there's a lot that's very difficult being in the role of trying to move resources as well. So I just wanted to bring that into the room. Thank you very much. That covers a, really a lot of topics. And I guess one thing for me is um, like you, uh, your experience from uh, the UK reinforces one of my, I guess, biases coming into this discussion, uh, which is true of philanthropy, I'm sure all institutions, that uh, legacy institutions have a hard time changing. And there's all kinds of reasons, the structures, the expectations, the board governance, like there's just a lot of, we, we built systems to work in a certain way. And so they're trying, they're becoming self-protective. I think there's a lot of discussion now that's happening. I'm kind of uh, interested to know like how quickly we can create expectations that there could be some change and actually shift how a lot of that money is being spent. I think our problem is that a lot of foundations are stuck um, funding um, the provision of things like services as opposed to saying, well, we really are interested in social change more than social delivery. We want to kind of tackle the root causes and obviate the need to fund 
those particular services. So that's really a hard transition for a lot of funders to make. So I guess that gives me an opportunity, Benny, <laughs> to talk to you. You know, you're somebody who's worked, at, you've been in grant seeking organizations and you've been in, in uh, now two, like at least two foundations. You've been on boards of organizations that are seeking grants. Like you've seen the system from many sides. You have a particular uh, set of issues that you've been focused on around health, mental health, and 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 basically, I, I think you were given the kind of opportunity a lot of people really think is amazing. You're given a blank sheet by a, 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 a family of donors who I think are very open-minded to be to learn as they go about what they're doing. I don't want to. I, I don't know what the situation is, but I think we'd be really interested to hear how you have kind of reflected on the kinds of issues that that Cassie has been talking about and uh, turned those into, I don't know, assumptions or criteria or aspirations that you brought to bear as you kind of designed and, and set up Daymark. How did you do it? <laughs> um, yeah, so the so to give a little bit of background um, on the family that I work for, so it's um, a, a family that has a long history in philanthropy and ha was for many years involved in a sort of major gifts form of philanthropy, large donations to hospitals and other institutions, and they had decided um, that they wanted to change the way that they do philanthropy and, and, and have more impact and be more engaged, uh, and so decided to set this foundation, and yeah, it was such a great opportunity um, and the blank slate really gave us a chance to start from foundational principles and I totally agree that when you're working in an institution or an organization of any kind that's been around for a long time there are entrenched ways of doing things and those are very hard to change and so it was just a wonderful opportunity to start and say well you've already decided that you don't want to be a big check donor so what does it mean to be more than a big check donor what does it mean to move on from that way of giving um and uh you know so a few things kind of shape the way that we think about what we do uh, in philanthropy so one is the family is very ambitious um in wanting population level change and just to give you a scale we are operating at about five percent of what north pine is operating at in terms of budget so uh so population level change with you know not we don't have an established endowment yet we don't um we're not granting huge dollars every year that is a that's a that's a challenge for us uh to be able to turn that into action so there's a few ways that we do it one is we think about systems and systems change so what that starts with is really um, trying to develop a deep understanding of the issues that we're trying to tackle. Who are the actors? Who are the stakeholders? You know, what is everybody working on? Having those conversations, understanding people's perspective, hearing about what the needs are, and, and really trying to understand and embrace the system and the issue and all of its complexity. And within that, trying to really get a sense of what are the system levers that can pull we can pull on that would have large effects and you know large ripple effects so i'll give you an example one of the areas uh, of focus for us is maternal mental health so mental health um, during pregnancy and postpartum and so you know the obvious thing that we could fund is services mental health services for women and birthing people who are in this stage of life and struggling with their mental health, but we're never going to get there if we just fund downstream services. So we really try to understand, well, what does prevention look like? Are these preventable illnesses? How can they be prevented? What does that look like? Um, you know, another, another thing that we realize is that this is one, you know, one of the only issues in mental health where there is an opportunity prevention because women during pregnancy and postpartum will have over 20 scheduled visits with a healthcare provider. So there's so many opportunities to be asked about your mental health, to intervene early. Um, and so we looked at, and what we realized is that OBGYNs, midwives, other you know perinatal providers, they don't know anything about mental health. They're scared to ask. And so one of the things that we funded was the development of clinical guidelines by the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada that are informing the standard of care for those women's healthcare providers. Now then that brings to question, so you have the you have the guidelines, but then then what? You know, how are people going to live up to them? So then we're looking at training of healthcare providers. So again, this is an example of how we're thinking, you know, how can we, rather than just waiting for issues to happen and tackling them downstream, what are ways that we could think about these system level changes, changes to the way 
professionals think about their scope of practice and what they're responsible for that a you know an OBGYN is not just responsible for you know like here down um, but that other parts of a woman's body are also important including you know her brain um, and so so you know really trying to understand and uh, understand that complexity so that's maybe one one area is is understanding systems levers um, the other area I would say is um, convening. So, you know, I think one of the benefits and the, the things that I love about working in philanthropy is that you're kind of outside the bubble, like you, you, have, a, you have a view on the entire sort of field and having worked, you know, as Tim said, inside the bubble. I get it. You're, you know, to a certain extent, you have a mandate to keep your doors open and to survive as an organization. And as a result, you know, we're not really creating the conditions as philanthropy, I'll get into that later, to, you know, to foster collaboration. But when you're outside, you kind of see what's happening. And, and I think philanthropy has a really um, uh, important role to help the system see itself. Because when you're in the bubble, it's just really hard. Um, and so, you know, as a convener, holding space for conversation, big questions, you know, that otherwise folks are not really... Um, are not really able to answer right because they're they're focused on their you know their part of the elephant or their specific you know part of the issue that they're dealing with and and creating spaces for people to come together spend time and think about you know what what is the bigger issue that we're trying to tackle here you know how can we work together as a field how can we build movements what does that what does that look like and and frankly as philanthropy being able to pay for that because that travel and you know and and attending events like that can be really expensive and so really creating the conditions for people to be able to to take that time uh, and 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 look at those things um, and then maybe a third uh, a third sort of principle that I'll speak to is um, we try to be a more than the money foundation. Uh, in that you know we don't see our relationship as transactional in terms of like you apply for a grant and then we give you the money and then like see you in a year when you write your progress report. But really, you know, first of all, we do a lot of proactive sourcing and co-creation of our proposals. So, you know, I've said, if I never have to evaluate a proposal again, like I will be very happy because I'm just not in like the proposal evaluating business. I don't think that's like a good use of, 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 you know, a philanthropy's time because it's just you're you're feeding that competition of who can write the best proposal. So, you know, we're doing more often than not as people are coming to us an idea and we kind of workshop it together and we say, hey, this is really interesting. What can we do? And and sometimes we're, you know, we're helping to shape that idea. Sometimes we're connecting that that organization with someone else who's doing something that's really interesting that could, you know, further enhance that idea. But, you know, we help to connect folks, we help to foster those partnerships, um, we support them in their, um, in, their, in their work, we act as a strategic thought partner, um, and as a, you know, from a McConnell days, as a critical friend um, to these organizations, and we're invested in their success. We're not there to judge whether or not they have been successful in completing their deliverables. We are there to help them be successful in contributing to the field level change that we want to see happen. And so it really is a shift in, and I think it really is a, is a, is a different way of thinking about that, the, the typical power dynamic that exists between funders and grantees where you know, you're holding all the power, but really trying to say, we're, we're actually in this together. We share the same goal our role is one and your role is another, but you know, we're, 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 we are truly collaborating together and, and really trying to do everything we can to, to foster that sense of shared over, uh, shared ownership over, over social change. Maybe I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay, maybe I could just ask you to sure. say one further thing, which is really, I think what you're alluding to in terms of how you're trying to pick your issue and the relationship with your partners, is really you're describing that you, you kind of have, a, have defined a certain ecosystem yeah. of players. Is there, yeah. like, are there ways in which you kind of see yourself as a catalyst within that ecosystem or just a partner? Or just maybe you could elaborate a bit. Yeah, on that. yeah. I mean, I think it's all of those things. I think, you know, I think we were, we can be a catalyst in a lot of ways. I think the questions that we ask can be catalytic because again, they're not, they're, they're those kind of wicked 
questions that people don't have the time or the space to be able to think about. And sometimes you kind of like put a question out there where like, you know, so, uh, you know, I'll give an example of our work in bipolar disorder, um, which is just, you know, you've got a bunch of researchers who are maybe, you know, working on different aspects of this issue, but just asking the questions like, what does it look like to advance an early intervention approach for bipolar disorder, which is just like the bigger question. And people haven't thought about that big question. They're maybe thinking about their like little part that they're working on and their contribution towards that, but they're not thinking about the big picture. And so when you bring people together and you ask those big picture questions, well then, then new ideas emerge and collaborations come out of that. So as an example, when we held this convening on early intervention and bipolar disorder, we, based, we, we said at the outset, we are not, you know, the outcome of this, of this convening is not winners and losers in terms of who's going to get a grant and who's not going to get a grant. We're just interested in knowing what do you think needs to happen? Then at some point down the road, we're going to figure out who's going to get the money to do it. But first, let's just decide and agree together what needs to happen. And then from that came these like little working groups and these little collaborations of people who are working globally, you know, from, from Australia to England to you know, the US and Canada, who are now able to think about something that is bigger than their individual projects. And, you know, money will end up flowing to individual institutions. But again, it's really trying to, to, to zoom out and say, well, what are we really trying to achieve together? And I think that in and of itself has a kind of a catalytic impact on the ecosystem. Great, that's great. Maybe I can turn now to you, Atif. And, uh, and it, I mean, obviously it would be great if we could hear about how you, like Bonnie, kind of came to this kind of blank page and sort of asked yourself, okay, how am I gonna approach how I kind of create some institutional capacity to be able to make social change? Uh, but before you do that, um, I know I've heard you talk about your view on this, who is the social good sector? Because I think it would be helpful for people uh, before you start talking about how North Pine operates, if, if you could share just a bit about your thinking about really how, how is the world going to see social good happen? All right. I'm going to need help from everyone here for a second. Could everyone here do me a favor and put your hands up about shoulder width apart like this? All right. Clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Peace be upon you all. Shabbat shalom tansi. Thank you so much for helping me out on that. Now, how many people here are actually part of the clapping sector? You're all so good at clapping, but some of you here must be part of the clapping sector. No? But it's amazing how all these people from all these different backgrounds, from all these different experiences can work together in harmony on something. So when I first came in to this world of philanthropy, I actually looked at the root word of philanthropy. And the root word of philanthropy actually means love of humanity. So in my mind, there actually isn't a philanthropy sector. Love of humanity is something that can be expressed by anyone from any sector, any organization, any place. But the thing is, what are we on a common mission for? And when we're on a common mission for something, we can do something in really beautiful harmony. So when I came into North Pine, I'm kind of someone, I've worked in every sector, you might say, private sector, government, nonprofits, community organizations. And when I looked at the goal of North Pine, which actually was a very, very simple goal, which was we wanted to create better outcomes for specific populations in Canada. And knowing that there's many people out there doing great outcomes for people, we said, how is it that they can improve on their models? And more importantly, how is it that those models can be sustainable and scalable? Now, some of the things that we happen to do differently, and I did not know that this was a different thing. Uh, I said, you know what? We would be willing to fund anyone from any organization that could create a better life for these specific populations in Canada. What that technically means is 
we don't just fund charities and nonprofits. We'd fund a for-profit company, a government organization, a community group. We don't care. We're sector agnostic. Because in our mind, there's no such thing as a social good sector. It's what's the mission of the organization? What's the mission of the impact model? And the other thing is we understand that impact models need different types of fuel. So we look at what we call tailored financing, which pretty much means we don't think that grants are the social good tool. We think you put whatever is the best fuel for the impact model that you want to achieve the mission. It could be a grant, could be debt, could be equity, could be a blend of all of the above. So we're very flexible and agnostic in how we do funding. We're flexible and agnostic in who we fund, but the things that we're hyper, hyper specific on is the populations that we work with. So for us as an organization, we're very much a startup organization. So I started in January, 2021, about to hit almost three years young. And like with any startup organization, you have no idea what you're doing until you get out there and start doing it. And you're continuously learning. So we said, we're gonna pick a few populations in Canada to focus on. Two of them are across Canada, which is refugees and formerly incarcerated people. Two of them are place-based, which is Scarborough in the east end of Toronto, as we all know, and rural and remote Newfoundland Labrador. Yes, I'm wearing a Newfoundland shirt, if you can see. <laughs> and what we say is we try to find impact models that we think could create meaningful outcomes in these communities, have space for improvement, and impact models that could be sustainable and scalable without us. Because this is the other thing about us. We're not always going to be there. We actually don't think it's the role of philanthropy to always be there. But how is it that philanthropy can offer a unique characteristic of how it works with these communities to get them from point A to point B? What that also means is you have to do a lot of bridge building because philanthropy can't do everything, philanthropy can't do it all. So as much as we talk about systems change, philanthropy is a very small piece of the puzzle. So we're constantly thinking about how is it that we look at partnerships with government, private sector, community, whoever it might be. And when we talk about sustainability and scalability, we don't necessarily mean pump more money into this organization. We talk about how is it that the impact model is sustainable? Sometimes that could be a social behavior change. Sometimes it could be a policy change. Sometimes it is pumping more money into that program, whatever is the most appropriate. So for us as a foundation, that's kind of our, our thesis in how we operate. But that being said, the most important thing for us is how is it that we build a learning system inside of our own organization? I always tell people, I mean, we're just about two and a half, almost three years old. North Pine has changed itself at least four times since we started two and a half years ago because we're continuously learning and pivoting and trying to figure out what works. And I think understanding that if you look at a so-called philanthropy foundation, just like any organization that's trying to work on something, everyone is learning how to do this together. So how is it that we learn with sincerity, with excellence, learn together as we're working to serve these communities and meet these missions that we're on? So that's a bit of how we operate and how we think so um so that is a great kind of entry point because you're talking about really you know what what your goals are how you're trying to reach that uh, maybe you could talk a bit about really how you design the organization inside i mean you talked about you've made these four inflection point changes already within the organization in terms of the design um i mean what, one of the ones that i know you've done is you you have basically a director for each of the issues that you're you're focused on and basically uh, unlike any other foundation i've ever heard of they're responsible for the whole gamut of types of um, supports that could flow from the foundation mm -hmm. towards that issue maybe you could describe a bit about you know what, what is the world of, of a director let's say a formerly incarcerated prisoners mm -hmm. in terms of what what are the the options or the different tools in that individual's toolkit that they're actually deploying and the range of demands that are placed on them and what they're actually doing yeah so first and foremost is understanding the context of the people that we say we're trying to serve and we also understand that meaningful outcomes are different for different populations and different contexts so the first goal of an impact director is to actually understand what is the meaningful outcome 
for this particular population in this context. The next piece is once we figure out that meaningful outcome, we try to determine what are the spaces for improvement. And when we talk about sustainability, scalability, that's a lot of partnership building. But what Tim is getting at that I guess makes us unique in the philanthropy world is 100% of the capital that flows through North Pine is designed by our impact directors. So in many philanthropy foundations, your impact directors might primarily just be doing grants. And then you have a bunch of other people here on your endowment side who are managing the investments on the finance side. For us, our goal is that 100% of the capital flowing through North Pine is connected to our impact. So what that means is an impact director works to figure out, is this gonna be a grant? Is this gonna be a debt? Is this gonna be an equity investment? What's the best tailored financing for the specific impact model that we're talking about? So that, that's a bit unique. And yeah, it's complicated to figure out debt, equity, granting, but it actually becomes much easier once you actually figure out like, well, what is our mission and what is our criteria? And to be completely honest, the financing side becomes much simpler after that. Uh, sure, we do our due diligence and we look through a bunch of financial statements and all that kind of stuff. But ironically, that's not the complicated part. The complicated part is figuring out what's the meaningful outcome for the specific community. So as I mentioned, the goal is to understand the context, how they do that is meeting with a bunch of local stakeholders, cross-referencing different groups. Our impact directors are all themselves leaders of lived experience, which helps them understand the nuances of the particular groups that we're trying to fund. Uh, the other thing that I, I like to say about our impact directors, it's they really just care about the end beneficiary and what's a meaningful for them. So we're not here to disrupt and change the charity sector. That's not our goal. Our goal is to create better outcomes for these end beneficiaries. We don't know what system change is going to happen by us doing that. And it's fascinating to see the ideas that come out of it. Uh, and some, it's funny, so, so our impact directors, I remember one of them told me the other day when they first joined North Pine, they're like, I never thought I'd be funding a for-profit tech company to create better solutions for refugees in Canada. But here I am doing it. And it was a way of kind of breaking apart some of their own mental models of how people would frame uh, the social good work that we do. And maybe you could just say, in any of the impact areas in which you're working, um, if you're, if uh, you know, the, your board of directors were asking, um, what what do you think is the timeline to get to a really satisfying outcome? Satisfying, I would say it would probably take anywhere between two to three years to get to a sense of is this impact model working? Is it creating a meaningful impact? Are we improving it? And most importantly, have we figured out the right partnerships that if the impact model is working to sustain and scale that work? So our mindset walking in to most of the organizations that we fund is typically between two, a two to three year uh, intense relationship. Okay, so that's two to three years for the kind of the first kind of creating a, your minimum viable product mm -hmm. in a sense, right? And yeah. then from that, then you can kind of shift to the next stage, which would be, how would you expand the impact through scaling of some kind? I would actually say that the vast majority, if not all the organizations we work with have a minimum viable product. Like they're, they're already out there serving these communities. They've proven it out in their own ways. So a lot of it is how do we frame the model? How do we scale the model? And then how do we build the partnerships that now enables that impact model that they already pretty much have an MVP on continue to scale beyond us? Right. And um, what do you think there have been unique things that North Pine has brought to those constituencies that they didn't have access to before besides money that kind of helps them um, conquer that scale in the space? Uh, actually, similar to something uh, Vanny said, a lot of our investees say conversation is something unique that they get from North Pine. There's many of these people who get funding from organizations who never, ever hear from, they don't even know who's funding them. And then they mail, they email a report once a year to this funder. They don't even have a face to the organization that's funding them. 
uh, where we are continuously having conversations with them. And through those conversations, we're doing collective learning with them. We're trying to figure out how we can open up networks for them that can help them continue to learn and continue on a journey for scaling. So I, I guess the that relationship piece uh, might be something we've heard from our investees. Right. So in a certain sense, I guess you're kind of um, pursuing a path that's very similar to Bonnie. Like you kind of see yourself as a catalyst for the field that is kind of orbiting in and around the issue that you're trying to have an impact on. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying and we're, we're still trying to prove it out to see if what we're doing is working. <laughs> that's great. So um, I'm going to open it up to the floor for all of us to kind of just have a conversation about this. But I guess, Bonnie, I'll just be asking, I know you've heard of North Pine before, but what, what are some of the things that that you were nodding to yourself about when you heard us uh, talking about uh, the path that North Pine has taken? Yeah, I mean, so many, I just love everything that you guys are doing. The, the post that you made on LinkedIn today was so interesting. Yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get out of time to talk about that. But um, I mean, I just think that idea of, um, of, of kind of sector agnostic, I will say, you know, we try to be sector agnostic and yet we are still dealing with some entrenched views on like, business is there to make money and charity is there to help people and what that means. And so I would say there's sort of um, a little bit of friction between the way that we say we wanna work and what that actually looks like in practice. So I'm always like very appreciative of how you folks have been able to do that because I do think, you know, and sometimes I'll ask, you know, an organization that's structured as a business, well, you know, why are you a business? And they're like, I don't know, my accountant told me to do that. Like, they're not, you know, they're not actually necessarily major philosophical decisions, or sometimes it's to do with tax implications or other things. So I think, you know, we, we, um, we, there are a lot of assumptions that we make about why people are motivated to have certain organizational models that aren't necessarily true. And I think in a lot of ways, those categories really hold us back. And so I think if we can ignore them to a certain extent, it's it's it, it definitely can be helpful. Um, so I love that. I really love the way that you picked your issues too. Like I love the two play space. Like you've got, you've got like, it's not even a field that you're working with. It's like the way that you have scoped things out is so, um, it's so interesting to be able to like really sink your teeth into like, what does a positive outcome look like? And like, what are all the pathways that we can take uh, to get there? So like, overall, I'm a, I'm a big fan of autism and what he's doing. <laughs> okay, that's great. And I just wonder, just before turning uh, back to Cassie, because two of you are in Canada, operating foundations that are kind of exploring kind of pioneering pathways to be able to do things. Um, do, is the regulatory environment something that stymies you, or do you feel that there's enough flexibility for you to do what you need to get done? Uh, we can do what we need to get done in the current. We don't have to make any policy change in Canada to do what we need to get done um, in a certain way. There is policy change in how the government, who I would say is not just the biggest capital provider, both in terms of financial capital and social capital to many of the outcomes in the communities that we care about, how they would shift their approaches towards better solutions for better outcomes, that is probably a big change. But as far as the, the CRA is concerned, I can, uh, I can do equity investments in companies, I can do debt, I can do grants, I can do a lot of things within current policy. Right, and just to clarify for me, since you basically kind of get your capital as you need it because you're not operating with an endowment, yep. so you have the uh, ability to use non uh, capital that's not inside of charities to do some of these investments. Like, do you have a do you have like a separate for profit or outside of the charitable regime where everything goes into the foundation before you make these investments? Oh, uh, everything goes into the foundation. Because I mean, if you think about it, and for people who may not be familiar with how philanthropy foundations work in Canada, they're essentially investment firms that have two stipulations on them. Uh, number one, you cannot extract the profits that you make from your investments for private gain. And number two, you have to donate 5% of your capital towards charitable objectives each year. But what that basically means is, 
all philanthropy foundations have loads of money in equity investments, in debt. So we just shifted it to where we want to do our equity investments and where we want to do our debt, um, being more aligned to our mission. So again, it's the, there's no kind of policy change that's required for us. Okay, that's great. Uh, any any comments about CRA? I mean, I think both Atif and I have the benefit because we started at the same time around three years ago. And so, I mean, I don't know how many Canadians are in this in this audience right now, but but Canada has had very kind of antiquated rules around philanthropy, you know, working with char charities have to give money to other charities. I think because we started when we did, we were able to develop some workarounds from the beginning to not force us into that hole, thanks to like, lawyers that know what they're doing um but i would say many other i still am encountering foundations who say oh man i want to give money to this nonprofit organization and i can't i'm not allowed cra won't let me so i i think for those who maybe um are not you know as much in the know or who have been around for a long time and have more kind of antiquated um whatever registration bylaws whatever the things are um it, it can be tougher for them for sure Okay, that's great. And just to, to let people know, there were some charity uh, reforms that happened in the last several years, which have made it more flexible for foundations to get grants into communities that don't have registered charities representing them. That's a whole recognition of that was a form of structural racism, really, Yeah. in, in some cases. So, so Cassie, you've been listening to some of the stuff from Canada. I'm just wondering if from your view coming from outside of Canada and actually the charity regime in the UK, uh, I always thought it was like light years ahead of Canada, it has so much more flexibility. You have you have charities that have been incorporated that we could never get incorporated as charities in Canada, especially uh, groups that are working uh, for improving the role of business that are inherently incorporated as charities. And I'm just wondering if you had any kind of observations or comments about what you've been hearing about Canada. Um, I do, but I'm definitely not going to go down the regulatory aspects <laughs> of the work. Um, might get might get things wrong. Um, I guess some, yeah, some of the things that um, that you both were saying that resonated. I think um, particularly, Vanny, about the the role that funders can play in like the, the positionality you have in the landscape. I think that's still like you have a view on what's happening where like when I worked at the National Lottery Community Fund we made 12,000 grants a year um, and obviously had a lot more applications so just the view of like what's going on and obviously there's a lot that's not in that data as well but I feel like that you do have a particular view of a landscape that is that is often very underutilized. Um, and partly because I think there's still that tension between like people don't yet don't sometimes know what role they want philanthropy to play. So do they want to hear that view or not? But I certainly feel like in working in the funding world, when you have that sense of what's going on where, because you're seeing it by what's coming in or by just like the different places that you're working how do you make that useful and of value to like the wider field so I think that's something that um really resonated I also yeah I think the the roles the um at, in the emerging futures unit at Joseph Rowntree Foundation we it's a new team and we are intentionally trying to well firstly we can we can also do grants, but we can also do investments. We can also, you know, we can, we're, we're doing that kind of mixed model. It's like what's right for the work rather than we're grant, we're grant funders and we're trying to avoid any language or labeling that is anything to do with being a grant manager or a funder um, because it's so easy to tip into those mental models. Um, I've been involved in a few things where it's like you've got a blank slate, design a new funding program, and you you just so quickly go into like, we're gonna choose this theme, okay. we're gonna design an application process, we're gonna, you know, that, that it's just so easy to get captured back into a way of conceiving 
change and designing for change. So those are probably two of the things that, but I, I was also just reflecting, I was like, God, I did sound so negative in comparison to like how you were both speaking about it. And um, yeah, and, and I, I guess like something that feels very different um, if I think about the Emerging Futures work at, at, at Joseph Roundtree, um, we're, like we're, we're really not thinking about themes or like, it's just very different. Like you, you've got this, you, you're like, it's mental health. You've got these four areas. And I guess some of how we see our role with the Emerging Futures work it is about actually trying to like signal intent around something or say we think the world needs more of this or we feel like like it's just it's actually just some very different approaches as well and I'm not you probably do that within the program still that's part of the work but yeah like I, I guess like some people work around missions some people work really with emergence so it's not about a thematic area because actually everything is so entangled how can you like what does it mean you, you can just start from very different places in in sort of systemic work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well maybe picking up on that you know starting very different places when we were talking I guess earlier you you were talking a lot about the question of uh, philanthropy and recognizing um do we have people in philanthropy that have the appropriate competencies and skills to be doing what they're doing? Could you speak a bit more about um, what you perceive to be, what some of those gaps are? Or maybe if you were thinking of uh, describing the characteristics and skill sets of somebody going in, into philanthropy, I mean, I'm using the word philanthropy, we're talking about foundations, but I guess the subtext here is into the, into the world of social change. That's really what we're talking about. I'll name a few and then maybe you two can pick it up. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I feel like there's generally not a culture in, I'll say UK philanthropy of, um, you know, experimentation and exploration. So like a very, you know, very central to design practice is the idea of, Hypo like having a hypothesis and experiment, you know, and prototyping, and that there just isn't that. There's a lot of like analysis paralysis, I feel, and a lot of navel gazing, and very little. How do we actually step forward and work out what to do by practice, by trying what to do? I think I talk a lot, and 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 I actually took the phrase from someone called Balji, who runs the Center for Knowledge Equity, and. She talks about weaving together lived, learned, and practice experience. And I feel like in philanthropy, we've forgotten about practice completely. So we don't actually value or understand practice. Um, so that would be one thing, I guess. The other, like I, I like to check in with people working around the moving resources um, of just about like, do, do you actually believe change is possible? And I know that sounds really basic, but if you're not, if, if you don't actually really, like really feel that change is possible and that, you know, things are really just stuck in the way they are, then I feel like, please go and find another job <laughs> because like, yeah. it's so, it, it's so core to the work. Um, and then I guess like a really obvious one, but maybe, um, yeah, it is just that that someone can hold that more systemic perspective, like they can hold plurality, they understand that, you know, change happens in all kinds of different ways, and we need to value different kinds of knowledges, we need to draw on different types of intelligence, we need to like use appropriate sort of theories of progress or theories of change depending on so it, it's having a plurality of skills methods mindset you know it, it there's there's a there's a breadth of approaches that are relevant to this work and I don't expect everyone to have all of those but at least an ability to hold some plurality great so yeah turning to you two what what, what are the kinds of skill sets that you have come to be predominant in terms of how you think about uh, what you need for your organization to be successful. 
Um, trust. I mean, I think I'm really thinking about the point that you made that not everybody loves like this idea of philanthropy moving in this direction of being sort of like in the work. And I will say that I have encountered that myself because there's some people, some organizations, some fundraisers who are on the winning side of that equation, right? They're very good. They have a whole, you know, they have a whole apparatus for fundraising and they're really good at doing it and that writing good proposals and, 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 and being successful within the sort of like legacy infrastructure of grant making that exists. And they wanted to keep working that way. And that makes a lot of sense. And for those, you know, I've encountered those and they're sort of like, well, why are you asking so many questions? And why do you want to know this? And they just want to talk about their programs and initiatives and you know I have to keep saying like oh, that's so interesting and I'm really like I want to hear but I I think I need to understand a little bit more about like what is happening first before I can like put into context the specific thing that you're doing can you help me understand you know the bigger the bigger picture and they're just not necessarily comfortable having those conversations and I think that's that's fair um but I think for for us just trust and like real relationships have been so integral to doing the work that way that we we have been doing it and the way that we want to do it which is like really meaningfully being a partner in this where we like I said it before we want you to succeed we want you to be well we want you to not be burnt out you know like we we care about you you know as people working inside this organization we care about the work that you're doing we care about the impact that you're having and really having that be like a like a two-way relationship we're also we're very open to their feedback how can we do this better what could we do differently you know we're constantly asking our grantees and our partners like how can we help you and and so I think relationships are are, are just really important um, in, in this work and, and finding the right partners and people who want to work in this way. Because I think if at the end of the day, what you want is the check, that's totally fine. I, you know, all, I wish you all the best and please, I hope you find a, a funder who will want to work with you in that way, but that's just not going to work for us because we don't, you know, we just, that's not the kind of relationship that we're looking for. So I would say relationships and trust building is a is a real skill set and partnerships yeah and partnerships. Which, yeah yeah that's um so i'm not going to talk about a skill set i'm going to talk about a structure and the key word is accountability uh so in one of my previous lives i was in the startup and investment world and i'll i'll kind of give you an analogy which is uh startup companies you make or break yourself by creating value for your customer if you're creating value for your customer, you succeed as an organization. If you don't create value for your customer, you fail as an organization. And any investor in your company succeeds or fails based off of your startup creating value for your customer. So an investor will fail if your organization is not creating value for your customer. When I stepped into this world of philanthropy, the first question I asked, is how do I fail? And the analogy that I draw, it's how am I actually accountable to the outcomes and creating value for the end beneficiary that we're all like, we're meant to serve on our mission? Uh, so the analogy that I said is like, you know what? I can go out, cut a bunch of checks, take some nice pictures, tell some nice stories, and think that I'm doing a good job. In reality, I have zero idea, and I'm actually not structurally accountable to creating value for the end beneficiary. And for me, that plants a deep-seated anxiety, because in my mind, I can only live in our business model if we're actually creating value for the people we say we're creating value for. So I'm constantly trying to figure out how do we build an accountability framework that, and I'll be completely honest, why is it that Arthur has a roof over his head, has food on his plate, and is pulling in an income if he's not actually creating value for the people that he says he's serving? Because I don't think I should be pulling in an income if I'm not actually doing that. So the accountability piece is the thing that I'm constantly thinking of, is how do we structurally do that in philanthropy? And that's why for one of the reasons uh, I toured my board early on, and we all kind of agreed, we don't want an endowment in North Pine because we just didn't want to sit 
on money that we can pull in compensation out of as we kind of just did a bunch of stuff. We wanted to figure out what was our problem solution fit, our business model fit to kind of justify our existence. And we're still on that journey. I'm still figuring out if I should be justified in my existence in philanthropy. <laughs> Um, your last point is is one that I think it, there's a bit of rumbling about across the world mm -hmm. about the role of endowments and if they have, in, in a sense, created this uh, sense of complacency in a, in a part of the philanthropic universe. You know, we're a system, we can operate, we give grants, we've got the endowments, we're going to go on forever, you know, don't bug me, you know, I'm, I'm operating, regardless of the, if there's an impact there. So I think that's a really interesting one. Uh, we're getting to the end of our time. So I was gonna ask each of the three panelists if we could, in a sense, do a bit of a closeout uh, with each of you sharing what you think might be one, two, or three ideas for uh, how we could accelerate the transition from legacy philanthropy to social change impact focus philanthropy. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'll end off on one comment. Everyone here is a lowercase p philanthropist. Uh, express your love of humanity in whatever structure, whatever mechanism that, that makes sense for you. And I think that is the absolute best thing that anyone, uh, any one of us in this room can do. Uh, whatever field you're in, whatever your sector you're in, there's no such thing as a social good sector. There's no such thing as a lowercase p philanthropy sector. We're all philanthropists. So just express your love of humanity and whatever mechanism that is in. Um, I guess one idea I have is around like really understanding the unintended negative consequences that grant making philanthropy has in feeding competition and fragmentation in uh, in the fields that we're working in. I think a structure that says you apply for a grant and you apply for a grant and you apply for a grant and you apply for a grant. And I sit here in my tower and I decide who's going to get that money. And then we complain that, oh, the field's so fragmented. You know, people aren't working together. Well, they're not working together because we're not creating the conditions for them to work together. And so I think if we can really understand the part that we are playing in that fragmentation and, and to consider the ways that we can approach our work to create conditions of abundance rather than conditions of competition and fragmentation. So for me, I mean, we had we had put a pause on our granting for this year because we were committed to multi-year grants and we were doing a bunch of policy work, but moving into next year, like one of the ideas that I have is maybe we just never give a grant to a single organization again. Maybe that's just not something we do. Maybe we say everything we fund has to involve at least two, if not more, organizations were working together to 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 you know address an issue or something, just do something together and to really build that into our into our funding model and to just think about all of the ways that we can create the conditions or incentivize or whatever it might be, the type of true, you know, cohesiveness and partnership and collaboration that we know is necessary to to achieve the big outcomes that we want to see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Cassidy, you're answering this question, I guess, from a different vantage point uh, from Vani and from Atif, because they're kind of working on their issue, but they don't have a mandate or a program that kind of addresses the field. Whereas with the next Frontiers Conference, in a sense, you've been addressing this question to the field. So you, you must have thought about it a lot. So maybe you got more than one suggestion for what could happen next. Maybe I'm going to go any. Um, I mean, I think I don't. I don't have specific things, but I I personally am motivated by and find it helpful um, to to situate all of this work in this idea that that you know we are in the midst of what's being labelled the great wealth transfer where there's you know the most amount of intergenerational wealth is going to pass hands in the next two decades trillions of dollars and so i i guess i get up every morning not 
not this morning, although this week there's other things on my mind, but with the question of, you know, so how do we, what what's the role that any of us can play? And I think especially if you're working around wealth and you can use that wealth to influence other wealth, how can we move that wealth outside of, away from private wealth hoarding and private wealth accumulation into public goods, into the commons, into reparations? And like, if we have those two decades, how do we put our energy and attention on the things that will actually really steer that in a different direction? Um, so that's one thing. And then I guess a more personal kind of bias. Um, I am also really interested in the role of philanthropic capital in incentivizing, and I hate that word, but I can't think of a better one. Um, incentivizing organizations and institutions that need to die because there is there is a lot of resource that continues to be sucked up by things that should no longer exist and because in business for example you know if something's not working if something's not making profit it it doesn't continue to exist but phil it is philanthropic capital that does keep things propping up so it's directly related to philanthropy um, and obviously I'm, you know, I'm doing a session on this tomorrow, um, but I, I think that it's like we have to make way for the new, and I don't think that's going to happen easily because things are clinging on for dear life, so I, I think um, there's, there's something in that as well. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I just, um, may, maybe in closing, I just wanted to, to say that uh, if... Uh, I was going to ask the question of myself, what, what, what could we do? Uh, well, one of the things that um, I think we could do is to uh, make sure that we share the stories of where the innovation is happening in philanthropy. So that was my goal in getting Bonnie and Atif to be here and talk about what they're doing in their, in their foundations. And in a sense, uh, help stimulate a much more um, uh, public, uh, discussion about the future of philanthropy. I think in actual fact, the public isn't demanding enough of our foundations. We don't have enough public debate about how philanthropic capital is being used. And uh, all that money that sits behind endowments has been uh, allowed to be there uh, through very generous tax deductions that went to the donors. And so the public is totally responsible for that money being there. It's given up gracious uh, benefits to the people who made those donations. And, uh, and I think that, that the foundations uh, should see themselves much more as being uh, directly responsible uh, to the public and their websites should kind of share with us the kind of information that would make it clear where they're making success, where they're not. We, we also want other funders not to make the same mistakes they've made. So let's hope that they report on their failures as, as well as their successes. Um, anyway, I hope you were able to get, get yeah. You have a, you got a question from somebody online? Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it is different from any, I, I think any, any field that is geared towards trying to influence this moment in history and trying to like orient us in away from all of the harms and into a, a different kind of future that any field needs a blend of, of the kind of skills and approaches and methods that I, that I talked about. Um, but I think in, in the, the, the moving of resources at this time that there isn't enough competency, that's such a harsh word, um, ar around complexity, like people that can navigate and hold complexity. Another question? Is that a much, does this work? No.
Hey everyone, thanks for this conversation. I really liked uh, the emphasis on the stuckness part. Um, my question for Atif, because I think Vanny offered an example of like having organizations work together. How would you contribute to uh, an ecosystem of accountability for philanthropy? Ecosystem of accountability for philanthropy as a as a kind of sector or business model, like for philanthropy, not like the charity organization. Like philosophy of philanthropy, where it's like an ecosystem of organizations that keep each other accountable. Yeah. yeah, that is super challenging. I'll be completely honest. So there's there's some groups in Canada that are trying to create what you might call like common signals, like common impact measurement signals that could be used for mutual accountability. But even that is so challenging. Uh, one of the reasons being is because each organization, each philanthropy foundation has their own unique focus areas. They have their own unique takes on what should be measured. Um, trying to determine an aligned signal for accountability of philanthropy, that is one of my grand challenges. And I actually don't have any solutions for it. It is, I, I talk about it a lot actually, because I think it's both for an accountability standpoint but it's also a tool, if we can figure out this common signal, it's also a tool that actually help, helps us coordinate capital and effort to further fuel what's good. I don't have an answer. It is something that I'm constantly challenged on. Can I just, um, just add, I just, I think the word philosophy is really interesting. And I think at the end of the day, like part of what's needed is even a culture shift within philanthropy, where instead of like patting ourselves on the back for all the money that we give away, you know, that we actually, like, I thought that that concept of creating value for your customer, like that is such an interesting idea. And so I think, you know, there's so much power in philanthropy and um, that it's, it's just like, how can we actually challenge ourselves to be better at what we're doing rather than just seeing the act of giving money away as just the good thing but that's it you know you give you how much and, and and measuring our goodness based on the amount of money that we give rather than thinking the what is the value we created with those dollars so so i really like that idea of like almost like a, a new manifesto or a new philosophy for for philanthropy one one of these challenges it's uh I, I completely uh, agree with that. But I find one of the challenges is what I call like the materiality of yeah. that value. So for example, we could say we work with uh, formerly incarcerated people. Uh, one of the things that we have done is provide supportive housing for women exiting prison so that they don't uh, go into homelessness and then end up back in, um, in recidivism, going back into prison. One of the challenges is like, Yes, we can figure out what's a meaningful outcome for that population. However, the materiality of that measurement, i.e., is anyone actually does anyone actually care to fund that? That's a different conversation. And I think that's one of these challenges that all these organizations who are serving these vulnerable populations, they're doing good work, even if they can measure it, they can measure the good work that they're doing. But the big challenge is who actually cares about that measurement from a resourcing perspective. In many cases, the biggest player is government. Philanthropy in Canada is pretty small fish, to be completely honest. There's about 120,000 charities and nonprofits in Canada who get about $400 billion annually in revenue, half of which comes from provincial government, only 5% comes from philanthropy. So what we find ourselves doing is trying to figure out, is there a way that we can align the meaningful outcomes for the end beneficiary to provincial government interests? And provincial government infrastructure in a way that will shift and change how they operate. I, that's, we're trying it. <laughs> we try it one step at a time, one venture at a time, but that, that's one method that we're doing. <laughs> Cassie? Um, I, I think there's two things that made me think of. One, it's not so far off. Um, well, actually it's still pretty quite far off, but I think a way into that is in, in the UK and Europe, there are, a group of foundations that have signed up to like a climate commitment together and I actually think that is a way into thinking more about a kind of wider planetary accountability and an accountability like there's been talk about how do you weave into that a kind of accountability to future generations and I think there's something interesting I've been chatting to some people about how you link 
sort of global philanthropy into some of the work that's happening around like planetary governance, which is a very underfunded field of work. Um, most people aren't paying attention to the planetary. And actually, if if planetary, if philanthropy had to pay some kind of revenue into like planetary governance as a way of creating an accountability at that scale. I think there's something really interesting there. I'm, I'm not saying that's really close to happening, but there are some conversations around that. Great, thank you for that question. That was great. So um, no other questions. I guess we've reached the end of the, of the evening and I just really, oh, we got a question. I almost didn't want to ask this because it's a really weird question, so I'm doubting myself, but I'll give you background. Please forgive it. So I got to be part of a fund that was giving away $5 million, and we couldn't give it away because no one could meet our criteria with what they were submitting. <laughs> and we tried to help. We were still unsuccessful. And it was terrible because we had amazing people doing amazing work, and we were so passionate. And so a couple of us left and I decided to start a innovation design firm, kind of a consulting gig. So we're not giving away any funds, code, code created. We're not giving away funds, but we're giving away fantastic ideas on a systemic level and helping startups and medium to high level businesses do incredible impact. We found different sets of challenges with that, i.e. funding, et cetera, et cetera. And then realized, okay, well, let's put our money where their mouth is. Let's just do the startup ourselves. But none of the business models actually make sense with the level and scale of impact that we want. So why don't we also attach a foundation to it that can work with the charities that are already existing and doing that work? <laughs> you see where I'm going. <laughs> so I guess my question is, how does philanthropy feel about mixed models? As in, yes, we have a startup and yes, we're going to have a foundation. And we're talking to VCs who don't get the scale of impact that we have. It sounds like you guys might, but I never even thought about going to you because it seems like you're only working with the first and second degree problems. And now I'm hearing for the first time ever that maybe you're considering a little bit more systemic stuff. Uh, how do you feel about this? And did I interpret your talk correctly? <laughs> Um, I'll say something that sounds a bit weird, which is I don't do systems change. And the, uh, uh, I had an interesting mentorship call when I first joined Westpine by someone who was a CEO of a major Canadian foundation for quite some time. He's like, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice. Number one, watch your ego because there's going to be lots of people telling you you're doing great things and patting you on the back. Number two, don't think that you're going to make system change happen because you won't. And I understood the reason of why he said that. The reason of why he said that was actually to liberate me. Because what happened is when we dove in further in the conversation, what I realized is if I was hooked on doing systems change, one of two things was likely to happen. Either A, I would burn out myself and my entire team, or B, would be mediocre at best. So what he did is he liberated me from this big macro idea of system change to focus on the micro of getting stuff done and scaling it. And then that liberation of that mindset actually helped me pursue things that could be system change in their own way. So I, I, I didn't get tied into the macro level perspective. It was focused much more on the micro level, but with that iterative vision of like, okay, ultimately speaking, how do we change the system? Whether or not that's a good idea or not, I'm not sure. Uh, it's just kind of the, the, the mindset that ended up resonating with me. Yeah, we have one more question over here. Since you asked, is it working? Since you asked your question, I'm going to ask mine too. Um, so my question is about on the other side. I think you folks all talked about working with the folks receiving the funds a lot but I wanna talk about the wealthy people that you're working with or the wealthy families or the wealthy co-op, whoever you're interacting with. So for Kathy, you know, talking about um, 
telling organizations that they have to die or disappear or moving their money or their or people that you're working with moving their funds and capital to other organizations what does that kind of conversation look like and to you two as heads of foundations talking with families and convincing them that you know this is maybe a model that we don't really see but take the risk your funds are going to just like have an impact in a different way that's going to transform the ecosystem how do you have that conversation with those folks and what changes have you seen within your organization as it has said you've changed four times within the time that you know you've been at north pine and how do you think that's impacted overall the ecosystem do you see these conversations happening within the sector um and yeah Okay, I'll start. I'll try and be quite short. I could talk for a very long time about this side of, the, of things because I think it's fascinating to work around people with a lot of wealth. Um, and actually one of the whole themes of the conference was on the psychology of wealth. And we had lots of wealth holders on a panel um, talking about that. Firstly, I would never say to an organization, you've got to die. I just want to like, say that. like. That's definitely not up to me. Um, I hope there's a lot more to, to the process than that. I've actually not talked about that work with some of the wealth holders that I work with. Um, maybe I will a bit further down the line. Um, but I do think, I think, it, I mean, this links to this whole frame around the great wealth transfer and the I actually I have to say like in the different, because I'm, I'm working in a few different bits of it like I work sometimes in philanthropy but I am working more closely with like wealth directly with like younger wealth holders who want to move their wealth very differently um and and what's happening around wealth that kind of field is happening really quickly now compared to philanthropy there is so much change happening with you know there's the there are these movements like resource generation I can't remember the Canadian name there's a there's a version in Canada there's a European, there's a German speaking one, a UK one. Um, there's and there's like whole swathes of people now trying to influence the wealth advice industry. So people that don't want to be advised to not pay their taxes and to keep accumulating wealth and extract wealth and um actually turning that on their head. Like people are demanding a different kind of wealth advice. Um and and reparations. I mean, there's obviously a very long way to go but you know one of the wealth holders I'm working with is now doing direct reparations um back into the Democratic Republic of Congo and there's yeah there's there's a whole industry now growing maybe I shouldn't say industry because that feels a bit sickening but there there is a real shift in wealth holders um and they I mean it's probably still a really small percentage but their recognition of where their wealth has been extracted from and what that means and I guess that's all a part of the kind of dying of philanthropy over time potentially you know philanthropy is not justice um yeah so so I I think that I think that is actually that that's where there's a lot more movement certainly in the UK and Europe um than there is in like institutional philanthropy such a great question. I can maybe talk about a specific example for us, which has been around health equity. Um, and that's played out in a couple of ways. So one is, you know, I think the family that I work with is very interested in sort of like, yes, population level change and like measurement and accountability, which are a little bit at odds with each other. And I And I think, you know, one thing that we've tried to do is really hand power over to equity deserving groups and communities and say like these are the people who know what the issues are and it's actually not for us to tell them like what you need to do but you know so we have some trust-based philanthropy model where we're sort of handing over large sums of money and saying now you go and you redistribute you, you, redist you redistribute that into your communities and I think that has been that was like a tough pill to swallow I, to be very honest um uh but I think because there is like there there's there is um a sort of feeling like like we want to know exactly like where our money is going and and the impact that it's having and so I think that's been one sort of shift for them and something that we've had to kind of socialize with our board to say like this is not act like 
I, you know, at one point I basically said like, either we do this well, work well, or we don't do it at all. So, you know, this is kind of the choice point that we're at. And if we want to say, if we say we care about health equity and we say we care about, you know, these particular groups of people who are uniquely and disproportionately impacted, then we also have to say like, you are the leaders in this field and we trust you to do with this money, you know, what, what needs to be done. Um, you know, in other ways, we know that mental health is, uh, you know, a pregnant and postpartum woman is directly related to discrimination that they experience in healthcare systems. So we can't actually disentangle and say, well, like, what are you doing specifically about mental health? Because that's our laser like focus, because for them, like their physical health and their mental health and their spiritual health and their emotional health is all tied together. And so I think trying to like communicate that complexity and, and, and say, okay, yes, this is what you want. And at the end of the day, it's your money. And so like, this is, this is the objective that you have, but really trying to like educate and inform and bring these like ways of thinking to the board table and, and to, to sort of bring them along with those with those newer ideas, I would say, in philanthropy.